All right, rock on. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear myself very clearly through the speakers, so I'm guessing yes. Great. Okay, um, yeah, my name's Dominic Widows. i a uh, researcher at IonQ, and we build quantum computers out of trapped ions. And I'm going to ask you to come and visit our booth, the far end of that room, and uh, myself and several of my colleagues who are here will be delighted to tell you about how to collaborate with us. And then I'm going to talk today about quantum cognition from inception to first quantum implementation. Because we've been doing this for actually quite some time. And I'm Thank, I'd like to thank the organizers, and I'd particularly like to thank uh, Julian for the previous talk. I think I would like to claim that this is very much a quantum-centric, data-driven approach to modeling quantum cognition. So, yeah, first application, and we're very data-driven. So, quantum cognition from inception to first quantum implementation. There's an entropy paper about this work that actually has a different title. It is Quantum Co Circuit Components for Cognitive Decision Making, because this is about the, how we build these things using quantum circuits. And it's joint work between myself and IonQ. Uh, Giotti, Giotti Rani, who is a undergraduate student at the University of California in Berkeley, who really started this work as an internship together last year, and Emmanuel Pothos, who is a psychologist, psychology professor at the University of London, and we've been you know, friends and doing joint work and collaboration and with common interests for some years. Uh, so we really are excited to see how this is coming together now. So. Uh, when I say from inception, well, here's the outline of the talk. There are problems with classical probability, classical logic, that have been known since the 1970s. There are challenges here that classical logic is not good for solving. And there have been proposed quantum solutions for these problems, well, really since the mid-1990s. And so... Obviously, not ones that could be run on a quantum computer, but ones that took quantum probability and said, hey, these problems with classical probability, we've got some idea how to solve that. And then just, well, last year, we've got enough of the hardware together that we can take these models and run them. It's fantastic. Uh, so I'm very excited to be able to present this work because I've wanted to do this work for about 20 years now. And then I'll finish with, you know, where is this heading? Because, of course, AI modeling, oh, it's big. So what do I mean by classic problems with classical probability? Uh, this isn't an example from the 1970s. It's just an example I picked, and do read it. I'll summarize it quickly for those at the back. Uh, that in a Gallup poll conducted in the 1990s, half the respondents were asked, like, do you generally think Bill Clinton is honest and trustworthy? the question on its own, but the other half were asked, do you think Al Gore is trustworthy just beforehand? And lo and behold, the number of people who said that they thought Bill Clinton was honest and trustworthy was larger proportionally if you ask them about Al Gore just before, and vice versa. This may not surprise you intuitively, so why is it a surprise for classical probability? Oh, well, it violates classical probability. And there are other known examples like this, known since the 1970s. Problems with conjunction, disjunction, order effects. This is an example of a cognitive problem with order effects. Uh, by a cognitive problem, I mean something that scientists find confusing, not that people who reason this way are problematic. This is a problem with our models, not ourselves necessarily. Uh, so the work of Tversky, Kahneman, and Schaeffer, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, uh, Dan Kahneman's book, the past 10 years, is probably one of the most engaging books in psychology. So this work continues, but really started in the 1970s. And What's the problem is we, if we assume cognitive realism, 
which is the belief that the answer to every question is really inquiring about a pre-existing state that already you already have an opinion upon, then the answer should reveal an already fixed state. But then how do you get the order effects? Because, well, in classical probability, if I ask the Clinton question, and then I ask the Gore question, the people who say, well, both are trustworthy, well, that gives you the intersection of the sets. But apparently, I get a different answer if I ask the Gore question first, and then ask to the Clinton question. Well, if those are the same sets each time, I can't do that in a way that makes the intersection bigger or smaller, or that makes the Clinton circle bigger or smaller. So, apparently, we violate classical probability when we answer questions, depending on how the questions are ordered and phrased. This is really interesting. Well, I find it really interesting, of course. <laughs> so, what happened in the 1990s and ongoing? Quantum probability came to the rescue. Uh, one of several ways of coming to the rescue. I'm not saying this is the only way you can solve this problem. I mean, honestly, you can solve this problem by just writing a rather artificial if-then-else clause around your you know, classical set theory model. The question is, how do we model it in a way that isn't just filling everything with conditions, conditionals to fix the answers that we got? And so, quantum probability works by comparing angles, not volumes. And so, this is very, hopefully, well, maybe very familiar to many of you, that the probability that the gore will be observed in the state zero, so if the state zero represents trustworthy, then is gore trustworthy? is represented in a quantum probability model by the magnitude of the projection from the Gore vector onto the trustworthy, in this case, the zero vector. Right? So, gives you the answer cos squared theta. And crucially, in quantum probability, as in quantum mechanics, quantum physics, when we get that result, we've projected onto the zero state. And that, perhaps, is the key difference between quantum and classical probability. The, the question changes the system. And you can see, just from looking at this, that, say, if we started in the zero state and ask the Gore question first before asking the Clinton question, then we get a bigger magnitude answer. What I mean by that, I'll try and... Sorry for the people over there, but I'll jump over here, is that what I'm saying is that this red dot here like halfway, is closer to the origin than this red dot here that if we projected to Gore, then projected to Clinton. So that, in a quantum probability model, accounts for this order effect, why you get different answers. So a little bit more. Now we're going to go to qubits and quantum circuits where it gets really fun. Oh, you might notice from the previous slide that by the time I've fixed the Gore and the Clinton axis, I've also fixed the relationship between the two of them. And one of the not lovely things about modeling this with qubits is that in a real qubit, we actually have one extra degree of freedom because we're using complex numbers, not real numbers, for all sorts of reasons that I won't... <laughs> We're using complex numbers, and so we have this extra degree of freedom on the block sphere uh, so that not only can we represent the relationship between trustworthiness and Gore and trustworthiness and Clinton, we can also represent the relationship between Clinton and Gore, and so the qubit has exactly the right number of parameters to fit this model, which is very pretty if you're a mathematician. Well, we're all mathematicians in that sense. Hopefully, it is very pretty to all of us. Um, so, we can build this using a quantum circuit. So, basic quantum circuit components. Here's a quantum circuit that implements asking the question, will an event occur? In this case, will the event G Gore is trustworthy occur. 
and we can fit that to the experimental data by setting the angle accordingly. I showed the cos squared theta, we'll just run it backwards, and that tells you what the angle should be. So we build this by setting the angle theta g from the observed probabilities. That's the theta g angle, the angle between the zero and the gore axes on that block sphere. And one caveat there, and there's going to be a couple of caveats here because this is an implementation talk. Um, what we do in practice on a quantum computer is we don't start on the zero axis and measure along the Gore axis. We do the rotation from the zero axis to the Gore axis and then measure along the zero axis. They're exactly equivalent mathematically and the second of those is what we do in practice because what we're really doing is not measuring pairwise distances between angles. We're measuring is this qubit in the ground state or the excited state. So little difference between the way we describe the theory and the way we actually build it on a computer. But they're equivalent. Now, Here's a circuit that implements asking, will C occur? Will someone say Clinton is trustworthy after that? Without measuring what happened in between. This is the key thing, the crucial difference. Did you ask the question in between? So in this case, this circuit at the bottom, well, I've really composed a bunch of rotations which will guarantee end you up in that G state and then at the end of the circuit you'll go and measure that and see what's your probability of saying that in this case G is trustworthy. And so uh, again I'll, I'll say since I only have eight minutes left I'll say please go and read the paper in the entropy journal that goes into exactly why this circuit looks the way it does or ask me afterwards. Now, the crucial thing, we're going to add the measurement in between while we're in the state G. And so instead of one measurement right at the end, we have two measurements. Do you think Gore is honest? Then do you think Clinton is honest? Now, here I would love to build the circuit exactly like this with rotate, measure, and then rotate again, and then measure. Now, I can't do that today. This is one of the things we hope will change. This isn't a physical difference like you're measuring the ground state or the excited state, really. It's can we really reliably do mi circuit mid-measurement and then conditional continuation? And we have experiments there, and we're still working on improving the fidelity of that process. And in the meantime, what we can do instead is have a ancilla qubit. An ancilla qubit is one that we add to a circuit to you know, fill in some extra property that we need for the computation, a bit like, say, um, swap memory in classical computing or scratch mem memory. And so instead of measuring the same qubit twice, what we do is simulate that by swapping those two qubits and then measure them both at the end so I know that the bottom qubit is in whichever state I set it to. I could start it in the zero state or in this case it has an X rotation, a quantum knot gate sometimes as it's called, to simulate oh someone definitely answered no to the first question whereas if I left it in its zero state it would be someone answered yes to the first question and then I can reassemble these probabilities at the end and get back to a situation that is mathematically exactly the same as having measured the same qubit twice, but at the cost of using an extra qubit. And of course, it's fine with two qubits. It's not so good once we have more than two qubits and we start running out of space. I wanted to go through this in a little bit of detail just to, to uh, this is, I picked perhaps the simplest example, you know, what can you really do with one qubit? 
Um, but I picked this to give an example of the sort of things that we quantum application developers do day in, day out, or when we're trying to solve a problem that, well, what can we do with the hardware right now? How do I adapt that to the information situation I'm trying to, to model? So again, uh, you know, quantum-centric, data-driven uh, design. I know what data I'm trying to model. I want to do that in a quantum-centric fashion. These are some of the things that I take into account today. And uh, just to uh, mention that this is not just a limitation of any particular kind of hardware at the moment. Mid-circuit mid measurement and reset is actually quite difficult. There's some papers demonstrating the potential for it. None of the major platforms actually supports it. But watch this space. I'm sure we will. All right. Other examples. Um, and feel free to ask me questions about that one at the end, but it's not just about order effects. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about disjunction effects and interference uh, for, for things like, for example, risk aversion. So this is a really canonical example of risk aversion from an economics paper. Uh, people are apparent, well, found to be willing to pay an average of $26 for a $50 gift certificate but only $16 for a lottery that pays either a $50 or $100 gift certificate with equal probability. Now, if you figure out the classical probability or the classic like objective maximization probabilistic payoff function that you would have in a classical economic model, this makes no sense. You would say this decision maker is acting irrationally. But we know that markets do behave like that. The market is risk averse. And um, I will um, refer you to some of the wonderful researchers, in this case, uh, Jerome Bussemeyer and Peter Bruiser, uh, who've examined many of these situations. And actually, their book on quantum models of cognition and decision really summarizes the work of many different researchers on these sorts of problems. And they model this using something very like a, this is my picture of a Max Ender interferometer, which you probably can't see at the back, but it's the, they use the same notion of a half silvered mirror beam splitter, and then if you have a phase shift in between, the probabilities might cancel each other out or reinforce one another. And the whole cognitive model is based on the idea that when you have competing ideas, if you don't know which is going to happen, then you don't do the classical, just sum them independently. They can really interfere with each other. But if you ask the question in between, then the interference collapses. And so these circuits, you know, four qubits, a bit more complicated, is described at length in the paper. And it's a combination of this interferometer interference component and then assembling some gates to make what is otherwise a standard classical naive uh, Bayesian network. Right, so looking forward, uh, we want to scale up, we want to include these in larger networks, what happens if we chain these together? I'm hoping that these sorts of components, your phase splitter interference, bit to model stuff you don't know yet, um, are going to become standard ways of assembling building blocks, and lo and behold, we're going to invent quantum neural networks. Well, of course, we're not going to invent them. There's a whole field of quantum neural networks, but I hope that in making them quantum-centric, we're going to be using these sorts of components, or at least being open to them. All right. In psychology, um, why and when do such supposedly small changes have such big consequences? And because we perceive things like gain or loss, risk or uncertainty, trust and doubt, good or bad, and it affects the way we interpret the rest of the information that's being given to us. Uh, this isn't just text. This happens with images, too. Uh, research on that, for, again, from Peter Bruce and friends. And in economics, how do perceptions of risk affect pricing? And uh, so a few minutes left. Uh, one minute left. Um, so, so I'm going to say quantum circuit cognition circuits are interested for anyone interested in more well, quantum cognition. Obviously, quantum circuits. Yeah, if you're interested in quantum circuits, you're interested in this physical quantum computing. Where you know we're asking, hey, we're using the hardware. This stuff works. Hey, we could really use this feature. Please work on it. We're interacting with the hardware teams. It's fun. Mathematics. I'm a mathematician. You've got to love this stuff. Uh, artificial intelligence, everyone's interested in AI at the moment, come on. Uh, psychology, yeah, come on, we all use psychology, it is us. 
finance. Yeah, well, okay, the point I'm making is anyone interested? I, okay, it's, it's research. I think everyone's interested in the, that's the nature of being a researcher. But I think there's some fascinating stuff here. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to the organizers. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you very much. We may have time for one question if you want. Yeah, there is a question here in the first row. I'm trying to speak loud. There is a mic. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, it's okay. oh, sorry, that doesn't work. No, try this I beg one. Your pardon. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, this is very interesting. It's new to me. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you actually found out the same numbers when you run uh, through these uh, algorithms. You see what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, sorry, yes, on the quantum hardware. Uh, yes. Um, the, we ran both the, those uh, prisoner's dilemma disjunction circuits. They got very, very accurate results to within a couple of percentage points. The order effect circuits, uh, they got the results we were expecting to within a 2% on, uh, this was last year, on our 11 qubit machine. And that was within the expectation given the 2 qubit uh, entanglement gate error rates we were expecting. This year's machine, uh, well, it was released last year, but anyway, we have uh, even more accurate machines this uh, year, our 23 qubit ARIA machine. Uh, I haven't actually run it on ARIA yet. Uh, partly because these circuits are really so small proof of concept. Uh, so, yeah, I would expect even better results this year. Uh, but, yeah, it absolutely played out on quantum hardware, so I, I should have said that. In bigger, like, this is not just simulation. It's a simulation of human cognitive behavior, but it is run on real quantum, uh, real quantum hardware. 